We are at 12. So officially, good afternoon, everyone. And of course, the way it always happens, the dog starts growling and barking. So if they continue, I apologize. <laughs> but thank you, everyone, for joining us today at Apollo's Nonprofit Bites and Insights. We are on the third of a four-part series around cybersecurity. So today we have with us Noah Davis from Train Technology, and he's gonna be talking about low-cost security tools and solutions for nonprofits. My name is Yanting Lu, I am from Aparo. Um, I'm gonna be taking us through the housekeeping items, a couple, a little intro, and then I will be officially turning over to him. So housekeeping items, yes, all of our webinars are recorded and they are all posted on our uh, Aparo website. Um, for those who attend live, you will also get a follow-up email um, that includes the uh, slide deck as well as the link to the recording and any resources that we might talk about today. Um, chat box is available for you to use. I see one of you have already started using it. Yes, please go ahead, drop your name. Um, let us know where you're coming from. Um, additionally, you have closed captioning available if you'd like to use that. So really quickly for those who are new or newer to Aparo, uh, we are a nonprofit that helps other nonprofits in all areas technology. And we do that by matching nonprofits with skilled volunteers um, to help meet their needs, whatever that need may be. So our services fall under three buckets, advice, education, and solutions. Our advice is generally our one-on-one -on -one consulting or coaching. Um, so if you have, a, a, it can be a small need, like I just need help with my Excel. We can get you connected with a volunteer to help you create an Excel spreadsheet. Um, education, we have team trainings and these webinars. Um, and then solutions are our larger projects. So if you're looking for a CRM, a donor management tool, um, business process analysis or technology plan uh, that would fall under our solutions. Uh, if you've joined us in the past two webinars, you know we have a team training opportunity. We have volunteers who are ready to uh, train your team around cybersecurity that is tailored and customized to what your team uh, is currently using and what your end user knowledge currently is at. So we will meet you where you're at. Finally, uh, if you want to learn more or stay connected with us, you can visit us at our website, subscribe to our email, or you can email me directly and I would be happy to um, direct you to the right direction. And that is it for me, Noah. Sure. Okay, uh, I assume you guys can see my screen. As Yinting said, right, I'm here to kind of talk about cyber threats, hygiene, and low-cost solutions uh, for your not-for-profits. We're going to go across the whole scope of Aparo services uh, from advice solutions, and, and I think the other was education. Uh, so we're kind of wrapping that all into one. Um, so this isn't going to be exactly a totally focused one on just the tools. We're going to talk about the threat landscape, kind of the, the how and the what that adversaries use or threat actors to try to get into organizations. And then we're gonna wrap up with the tools and how you can address it for yourself. So who am I and why am I talking to you today? I'm currently the Director of Cybersecurity Operations and Incident Response at Train Technologies. We work in the HVAC space. If you've heard of Train, American Standard, Thermo King, those are a number of our brands. Uh, my job is I lead the team of GI Joes that respond to the threats that you see in the news. So the Colonial Pipelines, the Ubers, the American Airlines, the data breaches, uh, all of those things happen against uh, every organization, regardless of size and scope. I just have a team of really, really smart people that help me respond to that and try to thwart uh, the adversary from their goals. In previous roles, I've helped design and build and test the controls that, that feed my team of Joes capabilities, right? Um, from IT audit to architecture and engineering. I've kind of worked the whole gamut of them. On a personal side, like I love the Carolina Panthers, except for Matt Rule, uh, and snowboarding. And the objective of what we're trying to do today is to help you protect your not-for-profit from basically things that go bump in the night. So let's go ahead and get into it. 
this is the agenda. And as you can tell, I'm keeping with the GI Joe theme, right? Where knowing is half the battle. So we're gonna start with the known, which is the current threat landscape. And I'm gonna walk you through today's predominant threats and what we see out there in the world. The unknown unknowns or the known unknowns, right? Which is their techniques. We're gonna go over multiple techniques and how the adversary works to help you spot the wolf in sheep's clothing. And then the unknown unknowns, right? How to plan for the unexpected hurricane. We're gonna to touch on prevention, response, and free tools to help you make your plan so you can avoid ransomware or the 80s band Scorpion rocking you like a hurricane. So we're gonna jump into the first topic of it, right? And what is a current threat landscape, right? Those are the threats that face your business. For ours, which is the manufacturing sector and HVAC, we're the second highest targeted industry. It used to be more on the financials and healthcare because of the value, but they've applied a number of different protections and there are regulations that require their maturity level to be higher. Manufacturing sector, generally um, similar to not-for-profits, cybersecurity isn't always the highest kind of priority for them. It's more getting the widgets out the door. So that's made us kind of a soft target and the adversary or threat actors have definitely come after us pretty hard. We know ransomware and adversary campaigns are literally a multi-billion dollar business. And we've seen the results from reporting about how it impacts organizations, large, small, and the resulting supply chain, right? So if we know all these things, then we know cybersecurity is relevant to you and your business. So we're gonna jump into the first slide of data here, right? And it's kind of a scary slide, but that's really why I'm here today. We're gonna to talk about 70% of the threat landscape, those boxes that are highlighted in this slide throughout the rest of this presentation. At the end, we're gonna give you the tools to address it, right? The threat landscape is the how the adversary will try to come at you, right? A lot of these statistics are based on uh, Palo Alto's Networks Threat Research Group. They published a report in August of this year, which encompasses the findings from their incident response engagement for the last 12 months. So all these statistics are based on the last 12 months. So we're first gonna jump into the topic of ransomware. What is it? It's a small kind of executable program, right? If you think about it like a Word document, that's also an executable on your desktop, but it's a bad one and it's very small. So it's very, very hard to spot. Um, and it encrypts the machine, making the applications and data unusable, right? Now, why do they do that? Well, they do it to prevent your business from operating, right? And they use multiple methods of persuasion, all related to extortion to get you to pay them. And they've changed the level of pressure that comes along with it. It used to be single extortion, right? Which is the encryption, making your systems unusable. Then they made double extortion, which is they encrypt your system, but before they do, they stole all your data and they threatened to release it to the public. So this could be your financial information. This could be your customer information, your vendor information, um, anything that would have value to you. And then they say, if you don't do this, if you don't want this done, pay us, right? And then the third, um, and, and we've seen some of this within our organization too, right? With some of our suppliers, it's called triple extortion. So they lock up your machine, they steal your data and threaten to release it. And then they start contacting your customers and suppliers, asking them to pay the ransom as well as you. Uh, so it's they keep ratcheting up the pressure, trying to make sure that they get paid. As I mentioned before in the previous slide, ransomware is a multi-billion dollar business, right? With that level of opportunity ensures that while it's illegal, it functions like a Fortune 1000 company, meaning they are more organized than the most small and medium-sized businesses. It's just a different type of business. Um, kind of like the bully on the playground, right? They're, they're called ransomware as a service. And it mirrors a legitimate business complete with customer service. There are call helplines for the adversary to make sure that the applications and executables are working appropriately. They have human resources that post on real job boards for skills that they need. And they have a network of suppliers and partners that help them be successful. So it, it is a very burgeoning industry, as you can see. It continues to skyrocket. We've seen a 134% increase from 2020, and it's 20 billion in damages. So this is, this is not a small threat. Now, the second one here, right, is called business email compromise. Ransomware gets all the press because it shuts down the business. That's why our gas prices spiked so high when Colonial Pipeline shut down. But it's just as damaging, but it's much, much more stealthy. It's where an adversary gains access 
to legitimate credentials. So your, your usernames, your passwords, and it's much harder to spot an imposter and they can have carried on within organizations for months and even years at a time. They'll do that to get reconnaissance, to talk about some of the techniques that we're gonna address a little bit later and help you be able to identify. Both types of attacks are, are prevalent because they generate fast and easy money for, for criminal groups. Beyond lining an attacker's pockets, these breaches can be used to fund and inform additional criminal acts, including those sponsored by nation states. And when you think about business email compromise, one that I'm sure you're all aware of is kind of the Nigerian print scams of the early 2000s, except they've matured way past that now. So it's the same concept, just much, much harder to spot now. So really, when you look at this slide, uh, the key point is really, it's not a matter of if, but when you will experience some type of attack against your organization. So if the last slide was the what, on this slide, we're gonna cover the how. And this is called an attack vector. Which way do they get their initial foothold within your organization? We're gonna focus on the three key areas that are highlighted and that covers 77% of the various attack vectors. So if you start at the first one, it's phishing. And to be very honest, the human factor has been the top vector for the past four years, right? We can secure systems and networks to the nth degree, but we can't stop somebody from clicking on a bad link or an attachment in their email. And the only way to do that is through training. But phishing is effectively fraudulent messages that are sent via email, SMS, uh, Facebook, Instagram, intended to get you or your users to make a mistake and spill the beans, right? Um, to either to do a type of action that's going to open a document, give their credentials, or otherwise kind of make your environment less secure. The second one on this is the exploitation of, of known vulnerabilities. And this isn't the zero day ones you hear about where vendors like Microsoft or Apple scramble to kind of patch those and make sure they get them covered. This is well known vulnerabilities that have been published for a long time. The adversary is continually looking for older systems and applications that have those known published weaknesses. There was a really good example recently, right, from uh, NPR <laughs> with an article on a toaster experiment. There was a guy named Andrew McGill, who was a reporter with The Atlantic, and he built an internet-connected toaster. And he put it online just to see how quickly it would take hackers to attempt to breach it. He was thinking, you know, weeks at the top, days, the end result was it took 41 minutes. And by the hour mark, there had already been three attempts on it. So what, what does that tell us? The adversary is continually scanning, right? The internet is a really big place, but they've gotten it down now where they can scan the entirety of the internet in a matter of hours, not days, weeks, or months. So the, the main takeaway from that is if you don't patch your systems and applications, you'll end up getting popped. The third one is called brute force attacks. And this is really more around Windows systems and the remote desktop protocol. It's just that Windows is typically used within 90% of organizations or more. And the RDP, remote desktop protocol, is an inexpensive freeway that many small and medium-sized businesses receive remote support. Just like we mentioned above, right, the adversary is continually scanning for this and they will identify those open RDP ports. And then what they do is they create scripts or automation that throw thousands of usernames and passwords against it until they find an opening or one that matches. This is why the general consensus is to use complex or very long passwords. So now, how does that impact kind of your sector? And in all fairness, um, there's not a lot of statistics about not-for-profits. So I use small and medium-sized businesses as a proxy because it seemed like it fit. And now that we've gone through kind of the what and the how, it should be pretty clear, cybersecurity is relevant. You may not believe that not-for-profits are a target. Hospitals and healthcare thought a very similar way until the adversary kind of woke up and realized that there's an opportunity in those type of environments, um, very critical services. You also provide critical services to the community and have data and systems that if inaccessible, have some type of value to you and the community, right? And I would, I would urge you not to put those at risk and really review some of the tools and techniques that we're going to cover towards the end of this and see what makes sense for your business. So the key, the key fact here is really the top bullets and it's 40% of, 43% of all data breaches involve small to medium-sized businesses. And then 60% of those that are breached 
close their doors within six months. There's a reason for that. Most managed charity providers reported that the average ransom cost for a small business is around $6,000. Now, depending on the size of the company, a lot of times you have to do a forensic audit, especially determining the data that may have been impacted. And those can cost anywhere from 10,000 to 100,000. All said, the average total cost of a cyber attack, especially if you have to provide credit monitoring services or other elements to make people feel more secure, ranges anywhere from 200,000 to in the millions, depending on the source, right? <laughs> if that, that cost sounds insurmountable, well, that's why you see the statistics at the top right. That's why 60% end up closing their doors, right? And, and the last point is kind of what I was talking about earlier. Security through obscurity, just because you're small, it's really not an effective solution against advanced adversaries. So great, we made it through our first section. And now we're on to the, the known unknown. So what are the techniques that they use to try to get into your organization? And between the last two slides, you now have knowledge of over 70% of what the adversary does and 77% of how they do it, which I kind of think isn't bad for like a 45 minute webinar. And if you remember our theme, knowing is half the battle, right? So what are your kind of known unknown? Adversarial attacks have been growing exponentially. You saw that in the statistic about how much ransomware has grown over the past year. The techniques they use continue to mature. You've heard that with the Nigerian print scams with business email compromise now to your much more advanced ones that use DocuSign or Adobe. Um, and what we can tell is this isn't going to stop. There's money to be made here. They're not just going to all of a sudden kind of change their stripes and say, hey, I want to be a good guy now. Uh, so to combat them, we need to know how to identify it when we see it and teach our people when they see something, say something. So let's get into the details of the known techniques. So how are they gaining access, right? Fundamentally, all these are classified under something that's called social engineering, right? And that's a, a, a term used for a broad range of malicious activities that are accomplished through the human interactions. As I said before, the human factor is generally the weakest link. It's been the top attack vector for the past four years running. Phishing emails. You're going to see a lot of trends through this presentation. So we're coming back to phishing emails, right? Is the number one method the adversary um, has. And they, they've set up servers just to blast these emails at minimal overhead cost. Have you ever heard the phrase, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take? Well, so have they. Malicious QR codes. Pretty sure everybody remembers during the pandemic when everything was kind of no touch menus, no touch advertisements, and everybody had little QR codes set up all over their tables, even though they were spaced super far apart. Well, these were used to actually redirect people to malicious sites that would either steal your information, input malware on your phones, or do other items. And the thing about QR codes is because there's nothing to necessarily test, it tends to skip through any email protections you have in place as well. Vishing. This is a neat one, right? Because they just change it and put a, a different kind of <laughs> sound at the front. You got phishing, vishing, and smishing, right? Vishing uh, is, is widely published and very successful, typically against our older generations. I'm sure all of you have gotten the calls about the IRS having problems with your tax returns, the Social Security Network, wanting to talk about your, um, your future date payments, uh, even car warranties, right? All of these are examples of people trying to call. And if they if they identify themselves with the IRS, the social security or, or car warranty, you're more likely to give your personal information, specifically for the IRS and social security, your social security numbers, your address, your name, and that's all they need. And then you have social media scams, right? Facebook and Instagram. Pretty sure everybody knows a friend who doesn't use MFA on Facebook and they've had their account hacked. If you don't, you would be in the minority if you haven't heard of anybody that has their account hacked. They were widely broad news stories, some of them ended up being fake, about people just claiming that they were hacked to get out of um, activities they shouldn't have done. Smishing. This is just phishing, which uses email. Now it's an SMS or a text message. And some of the recent trends we've started to see are for what's called spear smishing, right? Yes, IT people use really weird terms. Um, we, we try to think like we're fishermen and we're, you know, we're going after the big white whale. But regardless, uh, it's where they target somebody. So it happens a lot for newer employees, right? So 
they see that you get hired on LinkedIn, right? Or you have a start date coming up, right? And then they do their reconnaissance to figure out what's the organization look like. And then they send you text messages pretending to be somebody higher up in the organization, right? The first couple of them, and this is called grooming, and we'll get into this shortly, but the first of them are kind of more innocuous, not problematic at all. But then you'll find once they've developed that rapport, they make an ask, right? Whether that's for gift cards, for um, any type of service that they can use, predominantly uh, gift cards, but, but financially related transactions where they can get a benefit from it. And the last one are is fake job ads, right? So the IRS has actually published warnings about fake employment ads that, that could really cost you money. Um, and what they do there is basically somebody pretends to be your organization. This actually happens to us frequently at, at Train Technologies, and there's not a lot you can do about it. I'll, I'll go a little bit more in depth, but fundamentally they ask you to fill out a candidate profile so they can share it with the hiring team. And that, that candidate profile includes the same thing that you heard about on Vishing, right? It's, it's your PII, social security numbers, finance information, past employment histories, all of that stuff is useful information to the adversary. So we, like I said, we get regular reports of train technology that's happening. And, and what they do is they look at your hiring site and then they stand up a site with just maybe one or two um, alphabet letters changed in it. And so it looks like it's legit. It's almost an exact replica and they contact you to apply. Last year, more than 15,000 people fell victim to the employment schemes and they lost about $47.2 million based on uh, fake job ads. So as I said, the themes are gonna be around ransomware and business email compromise. What does that mean? How does it happen? Um, and how does it infect your business, right? Predominantly, it comes through phishing. That's why we talk about that one all the time. But that's when somebody sends a message, right? And they're either urging you to click a link or download a software, open an attachment that fires off executables and downloadables in the background that then at a, at a different point in time, you'll get a message popped up when, you're, when your machine has been locked up. Ads are pop-up windows, right? You've, you've seen these kind of pop up on your screen before. It looks like a Microsoft alert, right? Um, or a Dell alert, but they mimic exactly what those larger organizations have. And when you click the button on that, that is the permission that it needs to install on your system and start to execute. And the third one is, is downloadable software, right? So all of those games that you see that your kids love that are mind boggling to me. Um, but when you download software, particularly cracked software, there's a high probability that you will run into ransomware as you install that on your system. So free software is very rarely ever free. And now we're gonna get into a question of, can you spot the fish, right? So when you look through this, there are a couple telltale signs that we're going to go over that will help you be able to identify phishing emails and either report them, delete them, or effectively just not click. So we'll step through those now, right? The first one is if you look, it looks like a DocuSign email, but when you look more closely at who sent it, it's eservice.net and service isn't even spelled right. So that's a big tip off that, hey, maybe this didn't come from DocuSign. Second, phishing emails are very easily customizable. Don't be fooled because it's come directly to you or has your name. That is very easy to find and it's very easy to make it look like an exact DocuSign email. Third, if you hover on a link, you'll see where it's pointing to. We have a email security solution at my organization called Proofpoint that overwrites the URLs. But if you look, it shows that it goes to eServe.net and not proof point. And where you can see that is right around in here. The fourth point is Jeff Cohen doesn't exist in the address book and I'm not doing business with Jeff Cohen. So why am I getting something from Jeff Cohen, right? That one's an easy check. And then five, while it looks like a very official footer, that doesn't make it credible. They are very good at imitating real life organizations. And then the final piece, and this is one that you should always ask to yourself, was I expecting this, right? Was I talking to either a refinancing for a home or a small business loan or something that would have used DocuSign? If the answer is no, don't click. 
So as we just walked through that, now we're going to walk through business email compromise timeline and what it looks like. Right. So in a business email compromise scam, criminals send an email message that appears to come from a known source making a legitimate request. I'm going to give you a couple examples. Right. A vendor your company regularly deals with sends an invoice with an updated mailing address. A company CEO asks her assistant to purchase dozens of gift cards to send out as an employee reward. She asks for the serial numbers so she can email them out right away. A home buyer receives a message from his title company with instructions on how to wire his down payment. Right? Versions of these scenarios have all happened to real victims. All the messages were fake. And in each case, thousands or even hundreds of thousands of dollars were sent to criminals instead. So how do they do that? Well, first, they identify a target. LinkedIn is a great place to go to be able to get reconnaissance on an organization. You can actually look at the organization and see everybody associated with it and what, what their title is and how they operate. Then they will groom that person pretending to be a vendor they know that they use. And they will talk to them innocuously. This can be, you know, a day, a week, a month. They can spend a lot of time trying to develop these relationships. Then they do the thing, right? Which is, hey, you know, we... We've changed locations, we've changed banks. I need you to update our banking information within your accounts payable system, which you go ahead and do. And then they send the invoice later. You process that invoice. They're constantly monitoring the accounts. The minute they see it hit their account, they take it and transfer it. They either go through cryptocurrency or they go to a different bank and effectively the trail has gone cold, right? Now, if you, you or your company have ever fallen victim to a business email compromise scam, right? It's very important to act quickly, right? So contact your financial institution immediately. Request the con that they contact the financial institution where you just sent that money, right? And then contact your local FBI agent to report the crime uh, and file a complaint with the FBI's Internet Crime Center Complaint Center, right? They may not be able to help you, but again, that's giving more reconnaissance and information to the good guys that can help us try to thwart the bad guys. All right, we are now two thirds of the way there. We're making great progress. Um, and we're gonna talk about the unknown unknowns, right? So planning and preparation. As you can see from everything that we've covered, this is a very, very growing field. Uh, just because you're smaller doesn't mean that you won't be targeted. So now it's, how do you plan for the unexpected hurricane, right? The unknowns include if, when, and how you could be attacked or impacted from an attack on others. So that happens a lot frequently with us, right? A lot of our third parties are targeted because they are um, smaller in size and scale. And just like not-for-profits, they don't necessarily have the funds to be able to invest in super expensive cybersecurity protections, but the adversary can impact larger businesses by taking down single source suppliers or third parties that are critical for you to do what you need to do to make yourself successful. So ultimately, you got to plan for what, you're con what you can control. I'm going to keep with the hurricane uh, example because I kind of like Scorpion. Um, and it, it's similar, right, depending on where you live, Caribbean, Florida, Louisiana, right, on, on how you would prepare for a hurricane, right? The first thing you do is shuttering and sandbagging, right? So that's closing up the windows and putting the bags around your house to prevent the water from coming in. That's securing your entry points, right? Your entry points are your PCs, your networks, your servers, anything on the Internet, right? If the hurricane was coming, you would more than likely be watching the weather, right? Trying to figure out what it looked like. Is it going from, you know, a tropical storm to a category three? That's really kind of equivalent to like user education, right? They're the ones that watch your environment. They're the ones that interact with it all the time. They're the ones, if you can teach them how to spot the storm, they'll be your first sign of defense. And then the other part, right, is if a hurricane's coming, you're probably setting up a group chat with all your friends to make sure everybody's okay or where dry ground is. That's the same thing as a crisis coordination plan, right? And how you would organize everybody in the event that you had a, a ransomware or um, phishing, phishing incident within your organization. And the last part is, you know, you may even get a generator if you're super prepared, if the electricity goes out. That's the equivalent of backing up your data, right? So you want to you wanna take multiple backups of your critical data, and then you want to make sure some of it is like off-site. And off-site does include the cloud, as long as um, there's no connection or kind of single sign-on if your accounts are compromised that the adversary can get to it. So now let's walk through kind of all the recommendations. Um, and you're going to... The, these are the first set of slides, right? And these recommendations are, are pulled from the FBI. You're going to see a ton of commonality around all the recommendations over the next three slides. And the way I look at that 
is when everyone is saying the same thing, that's a pretty good clue that you should perk up, pay attention and start to listen. Um, the first one is timely application of software patches from your operating systems, right? That's your Windows or your Macs, right? And your and third-party vendors. So the easiest way to say that is patch, patch, patch. Remember from slide six, where we talked about attack vectors? Number two was the known vulnerabilities. Leaving around vulnerabilities is like leaving your front door open. If you wouldn't do that with your home, don't do it with your business. Email and website safety. <laughs> Do you all remember when we were smaller and we learned stranger danger, right? Well, now it's kind of flipped. We get into cars with stranger via Uber and Lyft, but stranger danger applies to technology use. If you know them, don't click the link in the email. Stranger danger email. Uh, the third one, right, is around updating your antivirus products, right? It's, you have to keep those updated because that's some of the ways that you'll be able to identify it, right? You. If you don't have a purchase solution, say like um, Cyber Reason, Sentinel One or CrowdStrike, right? And you're using Microsoft Defender, that's fine. Just make sure that you've configured it to update daily and download uh, the updated signature so that you can be as protected as possible. Backup your critical data on a regular cadence. You just heard me say that a minute ago too, right? If you don't have the data, you can't recover. Don't just keep it local either. Use the cloud to back up your most important information. Security awareness and education for end users. Is the theme starting to come through yet? Um, again, remember in slide six where I said the human factor was the top vector for the last four years running? I don't know if you all remember the movie Groundhog Day with Bill Murray, where he let the groundhog drive the car. Letting your employees operate technology without training is pretty much going to result in the same outcome as Bill and Punk's a Tony Phil. It wasn't good. And then create an incident response and business continuity plan, right? This is the same thing as, as the hurricane plan we mentioned earlier, right? Plan, 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 plan. The adversary isn't going to go away and they aren't going to stop. You don't want to make these decisions on the fly. I'm going to give you a, loads of tools and templates that will help you build this easily. That way, in the middle of a cybersecurity event, stressed you can revert back to what smart you thought you should do instead of asking stress you to make those decisions immediately. Um, I can't share a lot of details, but we did have a, a third party compromise with a smaller organization in our supply chain, right? And they didn't have a plan. That individual that ran technology when faced with the decision point at every point in time made pretty much the wrong decision. Um, when we get to the slide that kind of goes through that, I'll walk you through what some of those decisions were. Uh, because I have a slide on what you should do if you've been impacted by ransomware. And I'll kind of talk you through using that as an example as well. So now we move on to the second big theme, which was business email compromise. How do you prevent that, right? It, it's really be careful with what information you share online or in social media. By openly sharing things like pet names, schools you attended, links to family members, employees, your birthday, uh, you can give the adversary all the information they need to either guess your password, answer security questions for you, or prevent a more successful attempt at a business email compromise, right? We, we walk through the example of an unsolicited email and what you look for. Don't click on anything in an unsolicited email or test message asking you to update or verify account information or input your user account or credentials. Look up the company's phone number on your own right? Don't use the one that they put in the email message and call the company to ask if that is a legitimate request, right? Carefully examine email addresses and URLs and spelling using any correspondence. Scammers use slightly different, slight differences to trick your eyes and gain your trust, um, but a lot of times you'll notice a different tone in a message too. If it's somebody that you regularly deal with and they're talking entirely differently and using different vocabulary and have an urgency level um, that seems out of place, Pick up the phone and give them a call. It may save you a ton of money. Be careful what you download. Never open an email attachment from someone you don't know. Remember, stranger danger. And be wary of email attachments that were forwarded to you. Again, stranger danger. It doesn't apply to Uber and Lyft anymore. It applies to technology. Uh, the next biggest thing is set up two-factor or multi-factor authentication on any account that allows it and never, ever disable it. Yes, it can be a hassle. Yes, it's a pain in the butt. Yes, you sometimes have to get it through email. Yes, you sometimes have to get it through a phone, but it does the most out there to protect you. And we'll talk about what MFA is in a later slide and, and why that works. 
The next piece is verify payments and purchase requests in person if possible, or by calling the person to make sure it's legitimate. You should always verify any change in an account number or payment procedures with the person making the request. And then be especially wary if someone is pressing you to act very quickly, right? Always hesitate. You're never going to regret taking your time. You may absolutely regret moving too fast. So as I talked about earlier, we're gonna, we're gonna go through a little bit of, oh no, what do I do, right? When I'm hit by ransomware. Um, I am your typical kind of IT kind of nerd. I am a big fan of Star Wars too. G.I. Joe, Star Wars, and, and 80s music. It doesn't look good for me. I'm surprised my wife married me. Regardless, um, we're going to walk through these kind of six steps, right? So isolation. Some ransomware and malware, right? Ransomware, just to clarify that, ransomware is just another form of malware. It's a specific subset. But malware is like Trojans, viruses, things that go through um, and can either grab your information, export it. That it's just a general term for a lot of kind of nasty stuff that can kind of happen on a computer and make your computer kind of inoperable. Um, ransomware is the most severe case that means that you can't do anything with it. It's effectively turned into a big brick. But ransomware malware variants can spread quickly across your networks. So once you suspect that a device is infected, if it's ransomware, there will typically be a big pop-up on your screen that says, hey, all your files belong to us now and uh, you can't use this machine until you pay us. Um, the first thing to do is, is disable Wi-Fi, disable Bluetooth, and unplug the machine from both your like local area network or any storage device that may be connected to, right? That, that contains the spread. The most secure system is one that is entirely disconnected and buried six feet underground. That also makes it unusable, so I don't recommend that. But disconnecting from any kind of um, network communication also helps prevent that from going anywhere else. The other piece of that is don't shut down the machine. Right? If you shut down the machine, you lose data, like ephemeral data that is on your RAM um, that's being accessed for others if you choose to bring in a third party that they can analyze that information. So just absolutely disconnect it and don't communicate um, with the attacker or anyone, anyone else. And then you have to identify the infection, right? So this is also kind of what I was talking about with don't shut, like don't turn it off. Um, knowing what type of ransomware you've been infected with will help you understand how it propagates how it moves, what types of files it typically targets, and what options, if any, you have to remove it and kind of disinfect the machine, right? Sometimes you can even upload the ransomware note or a sample encrypted file. And not often, but sometimes there's, there's free decryptors. So you really don't have to make those payments. The third part, this one is optional, right? Reporting, right? If you do, right, uh, they will be able to assist you in your response. So the FBI and others will give you guidance. Um, with every attack reported, as I kind of covered earlier, the authorities get a clearer picture of who is behind the attacks, how they gain access to your systems, and what can be done to stop them, right? So you would report this again to your local FBI field office and Internet um, Crime Compliance Center. The local FBI field service for Charlotte is on Microsoft Way. I think their address is 600 Microsoft Way. Uh, I don't think it's coincidental that they're beside one of the biggest technology providers in the world. Just going to throw that out there, right? Um, the fourth step is to determine your options. And really, you have three options. You can pay and take your chances. We're going to cover a little bit more around the risks of payment in just a second, right? You can hire a third party to, to assist you, or you can do what I call the maverick, right? Which is attempt to recover and restore on your own. Um, and that's effectively, you're going to be playing whack-a-mole with eradication and trying to identify where all it is spread to and be able to shut it down and make sure that you got all the files. Uh, and, and with that option, you should think of it kind of like cockroaches. For every one you see, there are 10 you don't. Uh, and then if you're still playing the Maverick, the other one that is typically very successful is to wipe it all down and start from scratch. Um, and then you would back it up later. The, the caution there is to be careful with those backups because you may restore the vulnerability that allowed them to get the foothold in the first place. That's why you have to identify the infection, right? How, how did they get there? so that you can make sure that you close that hole before you do a full restore, right? The fifth is to restore and refresh. And I just kind of covered on that too, right? How you do that, um, it, you just gotta take your time and be careful. And the sixth one is make a plan, right? As I said in the previous slides, plan, 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 plan. Uh, 
Remember the scorpions, right? You don't want it to hit you like a hurricane. So I've included a ton of free tools on the last slide uh, that will help you do this. Ultimately, covering from ransomware is going to be incredibly painful. Whenever you get that level of pain in your life, learn from it and put together the hurricane of plan that we that we mentioned earlier. Now we're going to have that discussion on kind of payments, right? And should you pay? Should you not pay? There's a whole lot to consider here. But there are a number of statistics that will help kind of support make this decision, right? But paying ransomware may make you a victim again, right? So research shows that up to 80% of organizations that pay are attacked again. 40% of those that are attacked again pay again. 70% of the 40 that pay pay a higher price the second time around. That being said, if you pay, only 42% said the payment resulted in restorations of their systems and data. So paying has less than a 50, 50% chance of being successful, and you may get hit again. Um, all that being said, the statistics aren't in your favor. <laughs> the next worst piece is, worst of all, you could be breaking the law. Uh, there are legal implications, right, if the adversary is affiliated with a sanctioned country, right? Think North Korea um, or Iran, right? There are adversary groups that operate specifically out of those regions. Uh, and trust me, you don't want to be in that situation. Uh, really, um, my personal opinion is the smartest option is number two, bring in a third party who specializes in this and handling these things. It'll help you be more like Yoda and stay calm. So now that I've probably sufficiently scared you, right, let's go to what can I do right now? Um, as we mentioned before, you've got a lot of themes in this presentation. Train your employees, the number one threat vector. Employees and their work-related communications are the leading cause of data breaches because they're the direct pathway into your internal systems, right? Their credentials are the ones that you said this person should be in. Informed and educated employees are the number one prevention method. Themes coming back again, enable multi-factor authentication. And this is where we'll deep dive that a little bit. What, what is multi-factor authentication, right? There, there are three ways to think about it. It's something you know, right? a password, a phrase, or a pin, something you have, right? A physical token, a YubiKey, your phone, or something you are, right? Which is your really biometrics, your fingerprint, facial recognition, et cetera. Multi-factor means pick two of those. Something you know or something you have is multi, right? Something you know or something you are is multi. That gives kind of makes it irrefutable that the person is who they say they are, right? Um, the next one is to secure your networks. Safeguard your internet connection by encrypting information and using a firewall if you can. If you have a Wi-Fi network, ensure that you're using a password on it and you're not making it uh, free to everyone or even certificate access. And I would absolutely advocate creating a guest Wi-Fi, right? If you have customers or vendors that come into your site and expect to have Wi-Fi, create a guest network that doesn't touch your internal network or applications. Change the default passwords for your firewalls, routers, and modems. Uh, that is also another super quick way to get nailed. Uh, if you have employees working remotely and you can afford it, use a virtual private network. That's, that's the longer term for the acronym of VPN. That allows them to connect to your network securely from out of the office. A VPN is effectively like creating a steel tube that all the communication with your organization happens with from wherever that employee is. So nobody can get to that data that's being transferred. The next one is use antivirus software. Make sure all of your business computers are equipped with antivirus software and they're updated regularly, right? This software, right, it can be found on online from a variety of different vendors. I know that uh, not-for-profits get a lot of discounts from um, Microsoft as well as others. But all, all software vendors also provide patches to keep their products and security problems uh, and improve functionality, right? It, it's recommended to configure all software to install updates automatically. In addition to updating your antivirus software, you got to keep your patching up to date. It's the same theme that you've heard before, patch, 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 right? That applies to your operating systems, your web browsers, your Adobe readers. Uh, this helps to secure your information so you're not creating any weak links. And really where you wanna get with that, I don't remember if you recall the kind of the Ronco Showtime rotisserie infomercial, 
right? You, you want to get to patching, being set it and forget it. That's how good you want to be at updating systems, right? Wherever you can configure it to do it automatically, absolutely do so. Number six is to monitor and manage cloud service providers. So consider using a cloud service provider to host your organization's information, applications, and collaboration services, especially if you're utilizing a hybrid work model, right? Software as a service providers allow you to shift a majority of that responsibility for the security of the operating system and the application and data that, that resides on those systems. You will still be, it's called a shared responsibility model. You'll still be responsible for ensuring that you enabled MFA if they allow it and the users and access that you configure. They can't, they typically don't provision those accounts for you. So you're responsible for that and that ensuring that you're keeping those up to date as people leave your organization. And the last one is to secure, protect, and back up sensitive data, right? So secure your payment processing if you take payment cards. Um, control your physical access to laptops and ensure that they have screen timeout settings, right? So that when you wake it up again, you have to log in again on your mobile devices and lock laptops. Audit your applications regularly for users who no longer work for you. And back up your data, including off-site storage. So that's what you can do right now. And now we're going to get into the part where I think you'll find some value. Um, but this is the free part, right? So <laughs> as you've heard from the theme before, everything MFA, right? Uh, there's a link in here. I'm gonna share this deck with you through Aparo after this webinar, right? But this one, this link particularly shows you how to configure Apple, Google, Microsoft, Yahoo. And for those old schoolers like me, uh, I figure there might be some of them on the call, even AOL if you're still using it, right? They, they all do MFA. Um, you need to conduct security awareness training, right? We mentioned that. The Wiser um, has free security awareness training. Uh, and if you choose to use their, their paid service, they have discounts for not-for-profits, right? Um, they do phishing simulation, compliance training, and kind of policy management too. So uh, that's a really good resource. Conduct a cyber resilience review. Now I'm gonna give a shout out to Aparo here because I also volunteer for their gain security assessments. Um, if you can do that, get in it. If not, the Department of Homeland Security has partnered with uh, CERT or the Computer Emergency Response Team, and they've created a cyber resiliency review. This is a link to that template. It's a non-technical assessment, right, to evaluate your operational resilience and cybersecurity practices. You can either complete the assessment yourself, or you can request a facilitated assessment by DHS, uh, Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity Professionals, right? As I said before, plan, 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 Create a cybersecurity plan. Uh, the Federal Communications Commission's the FCC offers a cybersecurity planning tool. It's called the Small Business Cyber Planner 2.0 to help you build a custom strategy and cybersecurity plan based on your unique uh, business or not-for-profit needs. And then some of these next ones, you'll, you'll see them. I'm going to kind of hit them. Uh, conduct vulnerability scans, right? The Department of Homeland Security, through its sub-agency, uh, CHISA, which is the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, that's a mouthful, offers free cyber hygiene vulnerability scanning for small businesses and not-for-profits. They offer several scanning and testing services to help organizations assess and expose the threats that will ultimately um, help you be able to remediate them and addressing the known vulnerabilities within your environment. Take advantage of the free cybersecurity services and tools that CHISA offers. There's a ton of them. They've compiled a list, even if you go onto that site and click through it, that expand and talk about all the various different tools, where they fit within it. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure if any of you um, do a lot with information communication technology supply chains, right? But there's an ICT supply chain risk management toolkit that can also help shield your business and information um, from sophisticated kind of supply chain attacks. Th those links are available too. I'm going to bring some of these over so you can see what they look like. Yintin, can you can you see these tabs? No, we're still on the, the slide. All right, then I will have to stop sharing and try sharing that. Give me just a minute. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. So this is the one on MFA, right? This is part of the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, the, the mouthful one, right? As you scroll down through some of this, it tells you what multi-factor is, um, how do you enable it, 
and then the the resources here right so protect your tells you how to do it for google apple microsoft yahoo and aol um this is wiser's page that shows you their no nonsense kind of security awareness training there's some free trainings right when you go into pricing um you can see at the bottom there's discounted pricing for education not for profits and government she also has the cyber resilience review again i think aparo does a great job with this on the gain uh, workshops that they have but you can you can definitely um request a, a facilitated review here the fcc this one's really cool right is your custom planner so you put your company name your city your state you pick the areas you want and then you just say click and generate your plan right so this is super easy and then it helps you make smarter decisions in times of stress um she's also has a whole thing for small businesses so as a proxy for not-for-profit there's a lot of information in here that is also i think beneficial for you to read through uh the cyber hygiene services that we talked about where they do free vulnerability scanning um how much does it cost available at no cost so again um these are free free resources available to you that will make you more secure and the last one is kind of get your stuff off search, also done by Chisa, right? Um, and it talks about the tools that you can use to see what you look like from an adversary. So if you can scan across it um, and then and then help yourself to minimize your attack vector. So really, that's that's an example of kind of what I'd hope to share with you all today. And uh, now I can really open it up to questions. I'll see what we got in the chat doesn't look like any so i can i can start with some of the preceded questions um it, the, one of them was two-step authentication beginning at login what is the best to use the answer is any right any multi-factor authentication anything that allows you to either get a one-time passcode um, to use your phone to use it through email preferably the, the phone is the best the gold standard is something that's called like a fido key that you you actually have to plug it into the pc but it's not necessary, right? Um, another question was, what is the best tool to secure secure passwords? Uh, I personally use a password vault. I use one that's a paid service called 1Password, but there are free services out there. Anything from a password vault um, that lets you generate random passwords and all you have to remember is one kind of key long phrase that lets you into your vault to copy and paste those passwords into other things is great. Um, anything to help with HIPAA risks? I'm sure there are. My organization just isn't involved in healthcare, and I can't speak to that one very well. Um, are digital password keychains a good security option for not for profits? Uh, yes. Anything that's going to help you protect your passwords is a good option. Um, again, we use password vaulting as opposed to kind of the digital password keychains, but uh, there's some on Apple that are free. There are some within Edge, and I think Chrome that are free as well. Um, I, I would tend to lean towards a vault personally, but if all you can afford is a, is a free digital password keychain, use it. Uh, are they necessary for smaller organizations? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> because I, look, I, I can give the example of my parents. There's only so many passwords you can remember in your head before you start to reuse them across all of the sites, right? And the minute you reuse them, if that data gets leaked, then wherever it's reused is accessible to an adversary. Uh, and th there is a whole black market for this stuff around authentication data. When I, when I started talking about ransomware as a service, there's a supply chain there, right? So there are groups and teams that focus solely on securing access, right? There are groups and teams that focus solely on building um, ransomware that evades uh, antivirus and detection capabilities, right? And then there are groups that go to those markets and buy both of those and then try to utilize them out out in the wild is, is the term we use for cybersecurity, right? But it's a whole kind of um, business behind that. And, and they're very good. So I would say any protections that you can afford, any free protections, absolutely employ them. Uh, there's an age old saying of, you know, that there are two guys walking through a forest and they run into a bear, right? Big old grizzly bear. They're kind of freaked out. One guy starts freaking out. The other guy starts to bend down and start tying his shoes, right? The other guy looks at him screaming out, what are you doing? He goes, well, I don't got to be the fastest man in the world. I just got to be faster than you, right? That's how you should approach your not-for-profit. Um, make sure that you're just 
one step ahead because the adversary always goes for the lowest hanging fruit. Um, now we had a question come through the chat. Uh, any preferred phone apps that help secure calls versus personal? So what do you, I need a little more help around kind of securing the call. Um, there are some built-in encryption features on Wi-Fi calling between phones and other locations, right? Um, and the security of the call, if you're using Wi-Fi, depends on the security of the Wi-Fi network as well. Um, for traditional phone line cellular calls, that's not something I've ever had to uh, encounter. And that's not necessarily a risk that from, from our organization, we're about 40,000 people. Um, it, it's not a concern that we have from cybersecurity much more focused on kind of where the, the adversary is, like trying to intercept individual calls uh, would take a lot of time for them without a whole lot of return. Um, what tools do you leverage to mitigate cyber attacks? So that that's a, that's a very broad question. Um, but in general, we try to practice a concept called defense in depth, right? So we have, email protection, right? So every email sent to our organization kind of gets scanned. If there are links in it that are, or attachments in it, it, it's sent to what's called a sandbox where they detonate those links or attachments to determine if they're safe, right? There's a kind of 10 minute waiting period on that. And if if nothing bad happens there, then they go ahead and forward it on to the employee, right? So you have, you have email protection, that's one layer, right? You have network protection, which is kind of a, a firewall. And that's also inspecting traffic in and out of your network. You have antivirus on your on your PCs, right? So there's there's layers to that. So it's it's very hard to say um, the specific tools and techniques to protect your network. Every everyone in your organization is kind of different. So it's about looking at where are all the parts in the chain that could be attacked, and making sure that you have protections over those, right? So um, antivirus or uh, EDR is, is the new kind of next gen kind of antivirus um, enterprise detection response, right? Um, networks, you need to look at your network security, your email security, and your endpoint security, right? Um, there are also other layers if you get a little more advanced around data security and making sure that you don't have data leaks so that confidential and sensitive information can't leave your business. But that's that's typically at a, at a higher level of maturity. Um, and then the, the next one that it says is what tools do you use execs? to keep your network secure, that's a firewall, right? Um, that's the best way to keep your network secure uh, is, a, is a next generation firewall. Noah, um, we had another question. Uh, when you were talking about password vault or manager, can you speak a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, so the one I use, and you can go online and take a look at that, it's onepassword.com. There's one called KeyPass that's, that's freeware as well. But what it is is, you have one master password, right? That then unlocks um, a host of, of all of your other passwords, right? So it, mine has a little kind of embedded application in my web browser. So when I'm trying to log into a work application or my personal banking application, right? It, it sees that and it just auto kind of populates for me. And then whenever there are requests to change it, it will cycle it for me. Um, and it makes it entirely random. Like I couldn't even tell you all I could tell you <laughs> out of all of my hundreds of passwords. The only one I could tell you is the one I used to get into my vault. Um, and then that back end of that vault uh, is also encrypted, right? So I believe it uses 1024 um, encryption around the vault itself. So uh, that's effectively the same thing as, as ransomware, except I have the decryption key and the decryption key is my password, right? So that's what allows me to get in and access it. And that's what prevents um, bad people from being able to get in and access it. Uh, and the, the cool part about that is it also does checks for me across all of my passwords um, using a site called Have I Been Pwned, um, right? Which, which they track all the data breaches and the information that are pulled from all the large organizations to see if your information is in it. And it will tell me if any one of my passwords has been included in a data breach. And then it will make suggestions to me to update that password. Uh, it's also kind of intelligent enough to be able to determine if the, the website or application I'm using has MFA available, and it will pop up a notice to me to enable MFA within that application. Um, so it's super helpful for me. I hope that covered your questions. If not, 
Yep. I, I think so. We have one minute left. I want to squeeze this question in. Um, you mentioned that VPN is the best option if staff work remote. What would be the next best option if VPN is too expensive? Uh, software as a service. So using applications that are that are hosted um, on the internet, right? Again, that shifts some of the security burden away and then they can access it from anywhere. So they don't have to be on your network to utilize that application. Uh, just make sure that for most all software as a service vendors that are accessible from the internet, right? Like Salesforce, uh, Microsoft O365, Google would be a form of collaboration software as a service. Um, they typically all have options for MFA. Just ensure that you're enabling that option for your user. Um, and then it, it makes it much more easy to do work. Our, our business is on a cloud journey as well. So I would say 80% of everything that I interact with now, I don't need VPN for. Um, and I can, I can work from home from anywhere and still do a majority of my job. Well, thank you so much, Nora, for your time. Um, you did an amazing job just breaking everything down and love your, you love your analogies, I got to say. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Um, everyone else, thank you so much for attending this webinar. We do have uh, one next week that will be focused on business email compromise. Um, so it'll be a deeper dive into what Noah talked about today. So please do attend that as well. Um, expect a follow-up email from me and have a great rest of the day. Thank Thanks. you everyone.